The Manosphere is perhaps the most controversial online subculture. There are men who claim that the Manosphere has helped them improve their life. It has helped them to get out of a bottomless pit of resentment, of the bottomless pit of a life without purpose. On the other hand, there are many voices, including many respectful voices, who claim that the Manosphere is a breeding ground for hate, for misogyny, and for toxic ideas. This is The New Idea Live, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. In this episode, with my colleague Mike Maza, we will discuss the Manosphere, what it is, what is good, what is bad, and what is ugly in it. Now, both me and Mike, in the past, we have been involved in the Manosphere, so in this episode, we will also reflect on our experience and our takeaways. So, Mike, let's begin with the basics. How would we define what the Manosphere is? Uh, thanks, Nikos. <clears throat> it, the basic gist of it for anybody who's not really familiar with it before you know, before today's podcast is it's a sort of self-help or self-development movement aimed at men, primarily young men, young heterosexual men, with an emphasis on uh, masculine character development, um, becoming uh, an adult male, um, you know, if, if, especially if you're talking to very young people. Um, and in particular, it's trying to help men develop and cultivate uh, virtues and social skills with respect to um, sexual or romantic pursuits, dating, how to have a better dating life. Um, and I think that's how it started, how the how these people that we that are called themselves or are called the Manosphere sort of aggregated together in web forums and blog sites um, over the years. Over time, especially as the culture war started to ramp up in the last 10 or 15 years, now it's kind of evolved into something where it's giving a whole perspective on gender relations in, in society or Western society in the United States. And in, in that sense, in both of these sentences, it's kind of a, um, a loosely, even a package deal uh, uh, type movement. So if you give just generic like dating advice, like you might find in a, in a mainstream men's magazine, GQ or something, be, be more confident and, uh, uh, wear nice clothes or something that might qualify you as manosphere. And at the same time, if you, all you do is blog about how awful women are and they're going to take all your money in a divorce and you're better off not even bothering, like that's manosphere too. Um, so really what ties it together is just, is it giving advice to young men about sex dating relating to the, relating to women? Um, no, now it's, it's one of the interesting things, Mike, that if yeah. one goes to Wikipedia, they will not find this definition. So, as you said, in the time of the culture wars, the emphasis is more on the toxic element, on the misogynistic element. Yeah. But you're very right to claim that it all started with something which the main emphasis was, this is what to do to make something better of your life, particularly in the area of uh, romantic endeavors. Yeah, I think that's important to keep in mind that when I said it's like a package a package deal, that that means there's some good and bad elements that are um, illegitimately being tied together in some way. So a lot of the self-help advice, like if you're having uh, a tough time dating, you know, that's probably something with you. It's not with women and you need to improve yourself and make yourself. That's basically good, good advice. I mean, depends on how you execute on that and what specifically you're saying. Um, but that's that's a valuable thing to offer advice on to to young men. And but then to package that with, as we'll talk about later, some of these uh, wacky theories about how, you know, women are always going to cheat on you because they're always looking for the, be you know, the next best, better thing. Um, that's that's the package. That's the toxicity of it. That's the poison, uh, as we put it in our title. So let us take our audience through a small journey on what has been the development of the Manosphere so we concretize a bit what you said. So the starting point was mostly dating advice or what people might have called us 
pickup artist, which is the art of seduction. But this was mostly focused, pickup artists, on quick gimmicks, on tactics that would take a young man who would be very shy or who would have no experience or very little experience with girls, and within a short period of time, would he would manage to find uh, sexual partners. So in my mind, it reminds me a bit of Krav Maga, the martial arts of the Israeli army, where you take a civilian who has zero experience and with some simple steps, with some tactics, you help him within two months being able to defend themselves. And I would put the emphasis on the on tactics, because this was not so much on the level of a character development. It was more like if you take these steps, you will manage to find sexual partners. And the pickup artist community became famous around 2005 with the book The Game by a guy called Neil Strauss, who uh, who was a part, who became a part of this community. Now, what Nico, was that, missing that, from... I, I think yes. it's valuable to say that that book was uh, a mainstream success. So th this yeah. this movement has been getting mainstream. You know, it was pretty uh, niche and underground, um, but this this book kind of mainstreamed it. Got it a lot of attention. There was even a VH1 reality show based around around this stuff at one point. And actually, it's a fun book to it's a fun book to read because the person is a kind of an insider, but then sees it also from an outsider point of view. And it focuses around the the adventures of a guy called Mystery, who was one of the big uh, figures in the early days of pickup artist. But then what entered the scene was the notion of self development. So the idea was pickup artists were about outer game. This is like tactics, gimmicks. But what was needed was also the so-called inner game. In simple terms, this means self-development. In simple terms, this means creating a character. This means becoming someone who is worthy of romantic success. So the idea was you build a character, you build a good self, and then you organically will attract the opposite sex or your romantic interest. And therefore, you don't need the tactics and the gimmicks. This is also a time where in the milieu of the of the manosphere one would often come across people who would name drop pine rant or who would suggest the fountainhead and atlas rug as essential reading for becoming a better man and also it's not a coincidence that some figures from within the pickup community as it evolved in including let's say quote inner game later became self-development uh, uh, gurus, let's say. So Eban Pagan is an example, who used to be David D'Angelo in his uh, pickup, uh, in his seduction uh, games, or Owen Cook, who used to be known as Tyler from Real Social Dynamic. So we have this fusion with self-development and also a fusion with ideas around spirituality. Then what enters the scene is a sociology, let's say, of the manosphere, a way of viewing the world. And this is what people might have heard as the red pill. Of course, the red pill is a metaphor from the matrix. The idea is you can take the blue pill in which you view the world as the powers to be want you to view the world, or you take the red pill and you have the painful realization that the world is different from what you were taught to believe. So the big figure in the so-called red pill community is a guy called Rollo Tomasi, who through five through a series of five books the rational male is supposedly revealing the true nature of women and the true nature of society so the red pill is heavily influenced by evolutionary psychology so it sees itself as a science so i'm just giving you the facts and it includes ideas such as that uh, women are let's say biologically wired to be in a specific way and you hear ideas around hypergamy as you said that women will want to quote, made up, and also that uh, there are different categories of men, the alpha men who women are attracted to, and the so-called beta males, which women just want for provisioning. Now, following these ideas of the red pill, many men became pessimistic. So the conclusion they drew, particularly when the red pill became a bit more political and said that we live in a gynocentric social order and therefore the whole of society, the politics, the institutions want to accommodate female needs, then many men felt threatened. 
And through the red pill, many men took the route of not wanting to do much with women, either because they were convinced that, well, if everything is determined, let's say, by who I am and I'm not an alpha, therefore I have no chance, or by the fact that men were afraid of women and said, uh, we'd, or afraid of the power that women have, and they said, we will keep away from women. This is the so-called MGTOWs, men going their own way. And the last development, Mike, is that particularly since 2016, we've seen a fusion of the manosphere with a particular side of the culture wars. So we see the manosphere actually becoming even more political, taking a stance in the culture wars. Uh, we see the so-called trad cons, traditional conservatives or Christian conservatives interacting with the manosphere. We see people around uh, Trump supporters interacting with the manospheres. And also we see the manosphere adopting very weird uh, and whack of use, uh, conspiracy theories, uh, things about, you could hear a lot of things about the vaccine, about how the war in Ukraine is a psyop or a money laundering thing and other things that are quite uh, usual these days in the culture wars. So this is the short history of the manosphere and also why it is relevant, because it has become politicized and it has become part of the culture wars. So Mike, why don't we tell a bit more about why this is a topic worth uh, exploring? Yeah, so there's there's two things I want to say about that. So one is why <clears throat> why there's such a thing as the man, like why does this thing exist? Why is it out there? And whether it's whether or not it's responding to some real need that men have. And the other is just why I talk about it on New Ideal Live. We don't usually talk about uh, dating uh, advice <laughs> on New Ideal. We talk about uh, other things. So the, on the on the first, I mean, there's um, pretty good. Uh, research that shows a trend of a, a particular young men it's young men it's young people generally but young men in particular they're each successive generation uh they're more likely to be virgins well into their 20s they're less likely to have uh any kind of romantic partner at all and you know it, well into their life um th there's just strong reason to think that there's a lot of young men who are just really in need of some kind of guidance advice on how to live a successful uh, uh, ro romantic life if you know, there's other things they need advice on too but it, that in particular in the manosphere I think is responding to that because there's um, you know uh, who who where would you go if you're a young, if you're 20 and you're completely clueless about dating? Who would you ask for advice? A friend, maybe an older brother asking dad's completely awkward. And he, you know, and you don't even know if the, any of these people uh, actually know what they're talking about when they give you advice. And here's this group of kids. Oh, look, I'm drawing from psychology and, or, you know, I was just like you. And now I'm this, you know, Lothario who gets all the women. I can teach you my ways. Um, so that's that's what's uh i think there's a real um need for this kind of advice the question just is 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 this advice being offered any good <clears throat> and then why should we talk about it well um the institute exists to promote and advance um objectivism ayn rand's philosophy for living on earth and a big part of living is having a successful romantic life uh, and we talk a lot about finding a career you love, finding a purpose, and we even have classes about this. Um, now, not to say that ARI should offer dating classes, but that this is a topic worth talking about, um, that it's an important part of life that, that we should uh, think about and think about how to give uh, young people who need this advice, uh, give, it, give them, help them navigate who knows and who doesn't know and what kind of advice to look for. Um, I think is 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 worth uh, spending time on. Yeah, and it's worth explaining why is this appealing. This is explaining and and asking ourselves because I'm not sure I have the the answer. Why is it that in these days so many young men find themselves in a position not knowing how to navigate the romantic and sexual scene? What was different, let's say, in the 50s, the 60s, or 
the 70s? Was it that uh, family ties were more coherent? We, you had a cool uncle or whatever. So what has changed and made so many people facing these struggles? So this is a question that we should at least put on paper. But there's two other, two or three other reasons why such a space is appealing for young men. The first is that almost everyone in life needs some kind of philosophy. This is not how they have it in mind, right? They don't wake up in the morning and say, where is my philosophy? As you say, their question is, why am I not a man who genuinely attracts uh, my romantic interest from the people I want to attract? But at the end of the day, everyone needs a philosophy. And maybe the manosphere gives them a bad philosophy or three different bad philosophies, but it offers them something. And this is why it is appealing. It offers them, as we will see, a tribe. Now, we will say that this is not something good, but it is a fact that many people, particularly these days, particularly in this society that tells you that you have to belong to a group, that the group is makes you who you are. So men look and look around and say, okay, I need my own, I need my own group. A second point is that we live in the, again, we already alluded to this, to this so-called generation of lost boys. This is a phrase that Jordan Peterson, I think, made even more mainstream. So there are many boys who have a need to look up to other male figures. And many of the early pickup communities, in some ways, they operated a bit like they had this cultish element that there was a very charismatic personality and other young men were looking up to him. So again, it's a good question. Why is that so many people today find a need to have such a figure to look up to and they can't find anything and then they have to turn towards these communities. And the third point why the manosphere is appealing to many people is that at least in its good, in its better parts, it focuses on the idea of having a purpose in your life. It focuses on the idea that you have to make yourself first worthy of romantic interest. And part of this is having a, a purpose in your life or having a mission. Now, what this mission is, again, the waters are very muddy there. But to begin with, the idea that many young people find it appealing that, hey, here's someone who tells me you need to make something out of your, on yourself and you need to work towards something that you're passionate about. I think this is a healthy message. One of the most prominent tropes in the manosphere is a trope that says, Chase excellence, don't chase women. This is also uh, familiar in the MGTOWs. Now, I disagree with the saying, I, but the first part, which is chase excellence, is something that in a culture of low expectations where we live, many young boys find this appealing and also find it different. Like, hey, I, I don't really hear this quite often. So here are some people who have high expectations of me. Therefore, something good might be there. So this is how they enter, let's say, the funnel of the manosphere. It's the idea that, yeah, there is a better way to live. And these people are telling me there's a better way to live. So let's see what will be the case here. Let's see what will happen here. Now, this yeah, is Nikos, can I, what could can be... I yes, jump right. in for a second? <laughs> sure. one, one thing to keep in... Yeah, one thing to keep in mind about why... And you and I were going back and forth. Is Jordan Peterson part of the manosphere? I think he... He should qualify as part of the man, but maybe not. Um, <clears throat> is that you know when you're saying things to young men like chase excellence or uh, Jordan Peterson, clean your room, something like that, like clean your room, do small tasks, and that'll give you a sense of efficacy and confidence. Like that to a lot of people seems like the most uh, cliche, trite, like thing you could tell. Like obviously, but um, you have to keep in mind that. Uh, people, a lot of people, a lot of young men, nobody's ever told them that before. So they hear this kind of advice, like chase excellence, have a purpose. And in some sense, like, what does, who, it, who needs to hear that? But no one's ever said that to them. Um, and then they hear Jordan Peterson say it. And it's like, you know, oh, he's so deep. He's, oh my God, this is great advice because they go and clean their room and do small tasks and they find themselves having a little bit of confidence and they think they've unlocked the secrets to the universe. But part of the reason for existence of the manosphere is that they're not getting any kind of advice from anyone anywhere else with respect to 
um, becoming, uh, you know, efficacious young men. Let me concretize this, Mike, from my own experience. I had a volleyball coach when I was 12 and 13. And he was the first person who ever told me something like, take yourself seriously or work on yourself. Of course, at that point, I didn't take the message. I haven't seen this guy since 98, 99. I still remember him deep in my 30s sometimes. I I would even like have a dream with this guy. And this says something that the one person who ever told me, hey, you should work hard because you have some potential and you're throwing it away. I was very lazy uh, in, in high school. I didn't train. So indeed, my volleyball talent was thrown away. The fact that one guy who actually told me this, take yourself seriously, do something of your life. The fact that he had such an impact on me that I would remember him 20 years later shows what you said, that this message might sound cliche, but particularly if you are not surrounded by people who are actually pushing you towards trying to reach your potential, the one person who might tell this to you will have an impact on you. And how weird the times that we live in that for so many people, the first person who told him, who told them this is a figure on their screen on YouTube or someone like uh, Jordan Peterson. So this is, this is, again, it's very easy to be cynical about this to say, oh yes, of course, everyone knows these things, but the answer is no. And again, I gave the example from my life where it was not obvious at all that someone would give me this very simple and, uh, and clear, uh, and good and good uh, advice telling me basically that my life matters now shall we move to now the darker sides of the the manosphere and the interesting thing is that as a movement the red pill quote promises you that it will offer you an alternative to the current society so it will tell you today's society is corrupt today's society is dominated by bad ideas, and we will offer you an alternative. But what I find interesting, Mike, is that a lot of the things that the Red Pill is suggesting, a lot of its main premises, are actually mirroring the premises of the society that it wants to attack. So maybe at the end of the day, the Red Pill is way less radical in the philosophical fundamentals and the things that matter than the society and the order it wants to oppose. So how about you kick us off with one of its main characteristics, which is Mike? Yeah, Yeah, so so the, again, we have to keep in mind that a lot of what's going on is different things being packaged together just because they're addressing a common topic. So you get a lot of uh, deterministic perspectives on human behavior from the manosphere, and that's very much in line with the mainstream. So, just for example, uh, Nikos, you were you were mentioning um, the hypergamy uh, hypergamy theory that's popular amongst the red pill type people that women are all a certain way and they behave a certain way and you just that's an inevitability you can't do anything about it. What you can do is learn to exploit it or something like that. And at the same time, um, there'll be the, the same people. There's certain types of men. And the best you could do is sort of ape or copy a certain type of behavior. You can't actually, you know, you're in one of these categories. That's how it's, um, that's how I say it's very deterministic perspective. And another respect in which the um, manosphere has become just a kind of uh, dark mirror of the contemporary culture is uh, I think it's very, um, it, the way to think about it is that it's reactionary. So uh, it decries the sexual revolution and uh, women's sexual liberation because it sees that as threatening. Women can make choices, so there's fewer options for um, the average guy. Um, and the reaction to that amongst a lot of these people is to advocate um uh, you know, there's a Christian manosphere. There's a, a tradcon uh, movement where what they want to do is go back to the time when women didn't really have careers. They were at home, you know, barefoot and pregnant type. Um, and there's, I mean, there's women that uh, are, are advocating this too, uh, unfortunately. But that is all um, 
just taking the mainstream and reacting to it. It's not off. It's not actually offering any kind of uh, positive um, alternative. We're going to talk at one point a little bit about the ways in which the manosphere is just a mirror image of feminism. So you get a you get a lot of oh, the bad uh, elements of feminism. Uh, Sorry, the yeah, the bad elements of it, and in a certain respect, it mirrors some of the good elements too. Uh, <clears throat> so, so there's this. Uh, the trend over time has been away from um, what you know the manosphere I was familiar with 10, 10 years ago, maybe a little longer, was very high agency. Like I was saying, like you can you know if you're not having success, it's your fault. You're doing something wrong. You can learn to become better. Um, it was, you know, some of the advice was very bad, but it was at least telling you take these steps and you'll become a better person all around, or you'll become at least better in this respect of being able to get, get a date. Um, that the, the movement has been away from that in line with the broader movement in the culture towards thinking of human behavior more and more deterministically. Um, and that is, uh, a, a recipe for a disaster. If you are 20 years old and you're worried that you can't get a date and you have no idea what to do, to be told that in major respects, there's nothing you can do uh, is that's why there's, you know, men going their own ways. That's why there's 20 year old kids complaining about how women cheat and everything. And they've never even had a girlfriend. Like, why are you saying these things? Um, Yeah. It's because they've absorbed this kind of deterministic perspective on themselves. And notice how this trend is everywhere. This idea that we don't have agency. And where does this come from? This comes from rejecting what is our main survival tool, which is our reason. So the manosphere is not big on free will. Again, the manosphere is very big on determinism. The manosphere is very big on ideas that if you dig under the surface are incompatible with free will. So notice what then will happen. If I have no free will, if reason is, if I don't have this navigating instrument, which is reason, then this world out there is a very scary place. This means that I am at the constant threat from forces that I cannot even understand and I cannot control. And this makes me someone without agency. And if you're without agency, this is a very scary position to be in. And then you will fall for every crazy theory you will see soy as a threat, uh, microplastics <laughs> as a threat, uh, all sorts of things like big pharma and the vaccines is a threat. Once you do away with reason, anything goes. So then you become yeah. not the confident, powerful, uh, p- powerful in terms of like, let's say existentially, pa- existentially capable subject, which would be, let's say, a masculine model. You become someone who at the end of the day is scared of everything, of someone who is scared of the world itself. Why? Because you cannot understand it. Because there's the matrix, so-called matrix out there, the, or capitalism or whatever, which is after you. And one more thing, Mike, because before I get back to you, you mentioned their fusion with uh, authoritarian ideas. I remember some years ago, uh, a guy called Rus, who was back then, one of the big names in the manosphere. Later, he withdrew to religion, and at some point, he flirted with the alt right. And he was talking with uh, with with a right wing authoritarian, and he said that he hates capitalism. Why? Because when people have freedom, as when the economy is led to be free, you will get uh, monopolies. So, in the same way that if you let the economy free, you're going to have, let's say, Amazon controlling everything. If you let the sexual market or the, so to speak, the romantic market free, then you have the 20% of alphas getting all the women. And then what will happen to anyone else? So you see the same arguments that are used for, that are used against capitalism on the economic sphere are used against freedom also in the sphere of its effect on the so-called, as they call it, the sexual marketplace. So very strong tendencies toward authoritarianism. And lately, in the last years, there are voices in the manosphere who seriously discuss, shall we take back rights from women? And since women got the right to vote, society has been going downhill and all that. 
Anything else on how the manosphere uh, mirrors the dominant trends in society? Yeah, I, I want to make the point. So <clears throat> one of the um, most important things to learn from Ayn Rand is about the power of philosophy for good or for ill. And something that she points out is that bad philosophies are, are um, used as rationalizations for people. So one of the things I think that's going on in the manosphere is um, if your romantic life is not going well, it's very hard for a lot of people. I mean, this is general about life in general, but especially with, with respect to sex and romance, it's hard to admit to yourself that it's your, your fault. Like, and it probably is. Um, why aren't women attracted to you? Probably because you're not attractive in some, in some major respect. Uh, and then, so one thing you could do is um, listen to the philosophies and the advice that are, as I was saying before, high agency, like you can do something about this. You can pick yourself up and make yourself better. Another thing you could do is uh, wallow in your own self-pity and um, take on the persona uh, or the uh, identity of a victim. And if there's a whole bunch of deterministic philosophies in the air that tell you this, this is a way for you to rationalize your own failure to take responsibility for your life and, you know, has a certain sort of comfort to it. And you know, you, funny, you mentioned um, the idea that soy is destroying, uh, destroying young men is one of the themes in this bad rationalizing philosophy that we mentioned. Um, uh, Rolo Tomasi is a, a big proponent of this, somebody who wrote a book called The Rational male, which is it should be titled the irrational male. But uh, th th one of the things they do is they take an incompetent and ignorant perspective on um, mainstream or more or less mainstream science and then turn it into a rationalization for something. So there's some like weak reason to think that soy is estrogenic and maybe messes with men's testosterone production. That's not true. Like there's a little, there's like certain research that sort of indicated that, but now you have this whole thing. There's soy boys and there's like memes in the manosphere about how soy is making everybody feminine and destroying your masculinity. It's completely false and it's crazy. Soy is actually a really good source of protein. You should be eating more of it maybe. So now obviously um, we are labeled okay. soy boys. We get that, right? Yeah. So now we'll be labeled soy, right. That because this is how they operate. They'd rather um, attack people who are actually happy and successful than admit their own, um, you know, uh, own, own failures. Uh, and that's one of the things that all this, um, all the negative parts in the, all the toxic or poisonous parts in the manosphere are doing for young men is they're giving them easy rationalizations and encouraging them not to take the more high agency perspective that they can make their lives better. And you mentioned and of course, the there's, there's a, Yeah. Let there's a, there's a, okay. Yeah, sure. Yeah, go, ahead. go on. Okay. Well, I was going to say there's, so, a, there's a way in which there's a way in which this can all like re like cyclically reinforce itself. So if you follow certain manosphere advice, what you're going to do is develop a personality and set of social skills that appeal to a very specific type of person. Um, and the, the kind of person I have in mind is somebody with low impulse control, uh, short range thinking, the kind of person who would sleep with somebody several hours after meeting them because they told an exciting bunch of stories. Like if you get into a cycle where that's the kind of women you're actually interacting with, of course, they're going to behave a certain way in the long run. Like that's very predictable that somebody with low impulse control would be more prone to cheat. So then you get all these stories like that Rolo Tomasi kind of propagates that um, ah, women are just going to cheat on you. It's inevitable. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy where your whole life and persona attracts the sort of woman that cheats on you. And then it seems like every woman cheats on you. And now you have this theory that says that's going to happen anyway. And it's all BS. 
um, and you don't realize you're in this uh, you're in this uh, self reinforcing um, loop. So it's uh, you know it's really can be really you know we, one of the drafts of our title we you called it soul poison. I think especially if you're in your early twenties to get into this kind of cycle where you where you um, where you start blaming your um, failures and troubles on other people rather than taking responsibility is soul poison is a good description of it. One more point I want to mention, Mike. So you mentioned Rollo Tomasi and uh, actually more people in the manosphere who follow particular evolutionary psychology, they would openly defend tribalism. They would actually say that, yes, we need tribalism. So my last accusation I would have for the manos here is that it's quite tribalistic. And they would say, no, we are geared, we are wired for tribalism. Man, but notice what this means, right? What is tribalism at the end of the day? It's not that we need strong communities of solidarity around values, around common values. It's more like we, we think in groups, we perceive the world in groups as like a metaphysical, epistemological need for tribalism. The problem with this is that this will lead you in being the opposite from someone with agency, the opposite of someone with a strong character who can face the difficulties of the world. So many people in the manosphere use the NPC, the non-player character meme. But at the end of the day, if we saw how many people in the manosphere jumped into the same weird theories around the vaccine or around the war in Ukraine or whatever, this is more like the NPC meme, right? That we all think in one particular way. Or if you think how they view the world through the prism of group, men, women, this us versus them, this tribalism is destructive for the soul and for the, for the mind. So how weird that a movement which is, they often quite, they, they offer the example of the Sigma male. That's how they call it, right? The guy who, is, who has his own mission, who is intellectually independent. But how is the Sigma male in any way compatible with the idea of tribalism? How can a movement who has intellectuals who celebrate tribalism be at the same time a movement that gives you this uh, figure to this the, celebrates the figure of the so-called Sigma male. But let's finish with this, Mike. So what would be a positive alternative, let's say, to the bad elements of the manosphere? So the manosphere, Before as you said, is the reactor. <clears throat> yeah. uh, can I just a little bit on the tribalism? I mean, this is one of the respects in which um, uh, there's a kind of, uh, you know, manosphere has become a dark mirror of um, like modern, like contemporary feminism. So you can find a lot of good stuff in contemporary feminism. Women should have, uh, take responsibility for their lives. They shouldn't put up with bad behavior from men. They should um, have careers, that, uh, sexual liberation. All, all of that stuff I think is good, but there's also this, um, blaming men for thinking every man's a rapist, uh, blaming all their problems on the patriarchy, it's, it's vic having a victim mentality. It's more plausible for women than for men to think that way, but still it's not, it's not right. Um, and you think of the kind of like um, one of the contradictions in feminism. So women are encouraged, they're high in a certain respect to have agency, uh, take responsibility for their lives, leave, toxic relationships, um, develop their own purpose and career, pursue their own happiness. But the other group, the out group, the other, in this case, it's a, the other gender, the other sex, um, that we think of more deterministically, like they're all potential rape. They're, they're all, you know, they're all misogynists. They're all, they all deep down, men don't take you seriously or respect you. Like that's just a, a part of the male nature. Um, and then the manosphere has just flipped that. Um, or at least, you know, there's certain good things in the manosphere, like you can um, be better your life, uh, clean your room, go to the gym, uh, uh, find a career you love, pursue your happiness, get that. So there's that element of agency for the in-group. And then the out-group, you have this determinism, well, they're going to cheat on you, whatever you do. She's always looking for the next best thing, so don't get too attached. Maybe don't even get invested at all. It's, uh, you know, it's a yin and yang, two sides of the same coin. 
Um, and in, in that way, that's one of the ways in which the management is very uh, conventional. Right. But let's yeah, let's get to the positive, I think. Uh, yeah. To, to finish so the up. problem is it's too reactionary, you said. So now let's switch and to a positive alternative. So how would a positive alternative look like? Um, <clears throat> well, so the, the way I, I, I think of it is if you have someone in, in his uh, young man in his early 20s, like what advice could you give him? He's worried about his romantic prospects and uh, he doesn't know how to get a date. I think you have to, there's, there's a short-term and long-term advice and you have to give both. Um, the long-term advice is more the character development develop a purpose, you know, think of the stereotypical guy who kind of can't meet women, can't get date, um, out of shape, maybe still lives with his parents, spends most of his days, most of his time playing video games, looking at porn, has a dead end job. Um, what do you tell him? What kind of advice? And, you know, that's, that's an extreme, but the stuff about find your purpose, find a career that takes a long time. Um, and that's the most important advice to give somebody. Uh, so if what is really motivating you is I just, I'm lonely. I just can't get a date. I can't find anyone. Um, you have to also give short and medium term advice. That's highly, uh, you know, that's easily actionable. Um, a, a lot of the problem with some of like the, the, we mentioned earlier, uh, the figures like David D'Angelo, who were about more about self development, like his, I read his book on dating 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And it wasn't, double your date. It wasn't that, yeah, double your dating. It wasn't, it wasn't that bad. It's got, has got some good advice. The problem with the advice is that it's about like what to say, how to approach somebody cold, like that kind of thing. And if, part of your problem is that you have garden variety, social anxiety. Um, a lot of that advice is not actionable for you. Like if you're too anxious to talk to a stranger, I can give you all the lines and conversational advice in the world. You're not going to do anything about it. So <clears throat> there, there needs to be some combination of short, medium and long-term advice for a young, young man who, who can't, um, get a date. And the first bit of advice is just that you have to start shifting your thinking about maybe it's your fault. Like, why are why aren't women interested in you? Like you have friends that they seem to have girlfriends and other people have you walk around town and there's couples holding hands. And so what, what's what's is it that women are just out to get you? Probably not. There's some, probably some respect in which you're just not appealing and you need to Kind of reflect on on what that is and that you know that's that's going to be a highly individualized thing like what particularly do you need to do um but that's the first thing to do to like both for short medium and long-term advice like you have to do that first if what you're doing instead is spending your time reading theories about how it's hopeless and women are out to get you that's not going to help anything as for right. short-term advice i think i think the basics are the best advice to start are the basics. Um, join a gym and get in shape. Uh, that can help psychologically too, in that it'll give you a sense of accomplishment as you, if you stick with it, you'll progress and you'll both like your numbers and your lifts will go up and you'll look better just looking at the mirror. That's a, that can be a big confidence boost. And also you're just generally more attractive, learn to dress better. There's a lot of really good free, advice but so there's good free advice on fitness there's good free advice on just like how to dress better how to get a flattering haircut fix your teeth your skin whatever your issue is um that kind of advice is 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 important in a, in a short term uh from a short term perspective and the best advice i ever got um when i was seeking this stuff out was that uh was to um learn to make some good dating profile pictures of yourself and make a dating profile. And just that's a, like, if you have a little bit of anxiety, that's a good way to, you know, get into it, break, 
break the ice, you know, it's just a text message, that kind of thing. And then you can go from there. And if now, if you can't even do that, if you can't set up a dating profile and you just, it just feels too hopeless and it, it causes you stress to even have to send a text message to somebody on a dating site, like, then I think you need to consider that maybe you should talk to a therapist because you have some underlying anxiety issues. So that's more medium term advice. Um, a, a lot of people with these problems, uh, in my, uh, experience talking to young men that are stuck in this kind of rut, probably they, they need course, some, Mike, not, yeah. Of course, yeah, as, we, as we said, oh, sorry, I interrupted you. No, I just, just the, you know, the, it, there's certain things you can do in the short term just to kind of boost your confidence and your level of attractiveness to the opposite sex. But in, in the medium and long term, you really have to think about like, was I really just, I just didn't know how to dress well or something. I looked like a slob all the time and it was just a knowledge problem. Or is there, was there some underlying, I was depressed, I was socially anxious or whatever. You, that's a medium long term thing you need to, to figure out. But if you really want to improve yourself, you need to start with something that'll give you some momentum. And that's things like, that's like, you can improve your appearance in a day. Um, and you can get in better shape in six months or a year. Fixing your character, finding a purpose in life, that can take uh, several years. And, you know, the the sense of you're not getting any younger as you go through this and you want to, yeah, I want to start dating now, not five years from now. So um, that kind of you advice know, is all great. It's the, it's the long-term advice that, and the medium-term advice that I think the manosphere really just is worse than nothing you can find all the fitness fashion advice you need from the manosphere it's the it's the medium and long-term stuff that's that's the harder uh and that they get wrong and of course it goes without saying mike as you said earlier that uh, objectiveness has no line let's say on how to be successful on the on the romantic field yeah. and this is us each one of us reflecting on their personal experience so i will end with this which again is how i yeah view it it really sucks and let's not underestimate how much it sucks not experiencing in life the value which is romantic uh, romantic uh, pursuits romantic uh, satisfaction romantic and sexual uh, pleasure and this is why i'm very suspicious of people who are so cynical of the mere fact that many young men are at least looking for answers that's the one thing the other thing is that romantic uh, happiness doesn't come automatically. You have to build a self who is, will be worthy, let's say, of uh, attracting a person that you will value and you will appreciate. And this requires work. But the one thing, the one ingredient which cannot be missing is here, thinking, understanding, uh, having a good view of the world, and think that you can understand the world and that you can change yourself and the world, which means reason and free will. Therefore, a movement that it can give you all the good uh, tips or advice or whatever. If it rejects these two, free, that you have free will and that you have agency, then it will go in all sorts of the bad ways that we've seen, uh, that we've seen happening in various streams of the manosphere. So at the end of the day, it's going to sound like a cliche, but at the end of the day, nothing can substitute a good philosophy. You start from a good philosophy of how you view yourself, what you are after in this life, and then you can go and uh, fix all these areas. And again, it's, it's not easy. It's very, very difficult. And uh, I give all my sympathy to people who at least are trying to find answers because there's a lot of uh, agony and suffering in young men out there and this is not uh, this is something that if you're experienced it it's not cool at all and it can have a very detrimental effect in your happiness anyway i think that was it mike unless you have any anything else to add no i think that was a good summation i mean the the basic point to to get across to young men is that you need to develop a sense of agency and 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 self-efficacy and it's not an easy thing to do and start slow and build from there 
Thank you, Mike. So many thanks to our viewers. If you are appreciating the things we do, the topics that we cover, we try to expand the range of the topics that we cover, but this will become even better if we get also your takes, your views. If you appreciate the show, like, subscribe. You can drop us a mail with suggested topics, with things that you would like us to cover. Also, you can send us questions regarding to philosophy for our Q&A episodes. And their monthly Q&A episode, I think actually it's Mike who is, uh, who is running them. So questions specifically for the Q&A episodes, at, on, you send an email on experts at ironrun.org with your questions for the monthly Q&A. For other comments or ideas, you drop us an email at, I think it's new ideal, yep, new ideal at einrand.org. That was all from us. Many thanks for watching. All the best. Thanks, Nikos.